I would like to first to thank the organizers, both PASEPS and also the Office of Research at UC Davis for the opportunity to uh, be here today and to present some of our uh, efforts on translating um, optical technologies into clinical settings. So um, I'll try to control the computer remotely from here. I have several movies, so it might be a challenge. Uh, Yes. Oh, yeah, it is. I see. No? No. Maybe we can try. Okay. So, <laughs> um, I don't know how many of you have been in an operating room. Of course, not as a patient. <laughs> uh, so, no hands up. So you'll be surprised if you walk uh, and you uh, watch a surgery that uh, these days in the 21st century, uh, same as uh, centuries ago, surgery is primarily uh, guided by senses. Primary uh, vision and uh, palpation. So, um, of course, you have a number of uh, imaging technologies we have a number of imaging technologies which have progressed significantly, and you heard about some of this in an earlier talk, like PET, CT, MR, uh, ultrasound. However, these techniques uh, can provide or locate tumor prior to the surgery, so they can provide a diagnostic. Uh, also, there are significant advances in endoscopic and laparoscopic techniques uh, which can uh, extend the vision inside the body of a patient. However, uh, these techniques cannot provide real-time feedback on the disease and the nature of the disease. So over the past 20 years or so, there was a significant progress in uh, um, using uh, optical techniques, in particular labor-free optical techniques, uh, for uh, characterizing and diagnosing tissues uh, and uh, potentially have the potential to provide real-time feedback. So uh, I'm working in one of this area, in particular in uh, developing fluorescence lifetime spectroscopy imaging techniques, which can eventually translate from a uh, subjective decision, which is based on senses and palpations today, to a more objective decision on, on uh, deciding if you have positive uh, or negative margins during surgery, for example. So I'll start with just one example how this technology can be, can be used. So one dilemma that the surgeon faces, the first dilemma, prior to making an incision, is to decide where the uh, margin of the tumor is, if it's here or here. In fact, there is no tool able to tell surgeon in real time where to cut and how much to cut. The second dilemma is to decide after this tumor is re uh, removed to some extent, to decide if there are any what is called positive margins or any residual tumor left. Again, there is no tool that can tell surgeon in real time if uh, there is any residual tumor there. So the only tool available currently is to take a biopsy needle, take a few uh, pieces of tissue, rush this to the pathology lab, where this tissue is, is now frozen, it is section, stain, and then a pathologist will look quickly over and provide feedback back to surgeon in about half an hour or so. So this uh, approach is not only lengthy, it is subject of sampling error because you can only take a few pieces of tissue and also it is costly. So we propose to use a technique uh, which is again based on fluorescence lifetime measurements which can simplify this process, can be adjunct to the current uh, uh, way of assessing and evaluating the tissues but this time using light to probe tissue. 
So in principle, we can have a light source that emits in UV or a visible range. You direct this light to tissue, and certain molecules in tissue have the property of absorbing this light and re-emitting light. This is called fluorescence. So there are a broad range of molecules which are naturally present in tissue that have this property. And then you can have uh, um, structured proteins like elastin, collagen, collagen crosslinks. Um, also, um, enzyme cofactors involved in cellular metabolism, as NADH or FAD, they have again the property of absorbing and emitting light. Porphyrins, vitamins. So it's a range of molecules that have again uh, this property. So pathological transformations will be associated with uh, biochemical, functional, and structural changes of these biomolecular complexes in tissues and cells. Therefore, they can be monitored based on these fluorescent measurements. However, as you can see on this, this chart, the emission spectrum of these molecules uh, is not only broad, but also they overlap. So distinguishing between these molecules is not impossible, but also it's not trivial. So, um, we, there are several ways of measuring this fluorescence emission. Either you can look at spectrum of emission or the wavelength, the color of light. You can look at the intensity of emission or what is called fluorescence lifetime or how, for how long these molecules will emit. So um, most of the instruments which actually made it to clinical settings and are some commercial available devices are based on intensity and spectrum measurements, where you look at the quantum yield of these molecules or how this, this uh, emission is distributed along the, the spectrum. But very few actually are based on fluorescence lifetime, which again measures the uh, excited state lifetime or how much this molecule will spend on the excited state. So we develop techniques which can capture information from spectral domain as well as from time domain. Uh, and we call this technique time resolved fluorescence spectroscopy uh, uh, system in, in a, a manner that we can uh, are able to us to distinguish between these uh, uh, fluorescent molecules in tissue in different conditions. So you can get the signature like the one you can see here. We have intensity uh, on the z-axis, um, uh, time, and also wavelength. And you can measure this uh, uh, decay of fluorescence as a function of time. You notice in this, this uh, graph that on the right side, you have the collagen, emission of a collagen uh, on the left uh, from NADH in, in a free form. So excited with the same wavelength, they will have different emission uh, um, spectrum, different peak emission, but also different lifetimes. So for example, when NADH will bind to protein, the lifetime will change from very short to much longer, will increase three or four times. Or a collagen, again, if you have collagen crosslinks, which are affected, including, let's say, inflammation, or uh, they, will have, they will be uh, affected, and therefore this uh, signature will be changed. So use this information in a manner that we can actually distinguish between different, different conditions in tissue. So to, to summarize why we want to use this fluorescence lifetime measurements, first is because lifetime information can provide a means to discriminate between this, this fluorophores, provided that they have different decay times. And secondly, and which is very important for clinical environment, is that uh, lifetimes are minimally affected by changes in intensity. It's very difficult to maintain a constant distance between the excitation fiber and the tissue in, in, in a, a dynamic environment. Also, you can have a presence of endogenous absorbers, such as blood, for example, and this will absorb the, the fluorescence, therefore affect the intensity or the spectral shape. So um, over a number of years, we work on developing practical instrumentation that we are able to move in the operating room. And you can see on this slide, uh, one of these initial instruments that we built uh, with a fiber optic, which is on the surface of a cortex here of a patient, and also this same fiber optic uh, probe that is handled by a neurosurgeon to, to uh, probe the cavity after the brain tumor was removed. Qualitatively, you can see that the fluorescence lifetime of a normal white matter is very different than, uh, let's say, low-grade gliomas. So you can use, again, various, uh, um, I think I have, again, problem of changing the slide. 
we can. Um, thank you. So you can use this information, this, this decay parameters and various parameters extracted from fluorescence measurements. You can reconstruct the emission spectrum. You can actually look at fluorescence lifetime, their distribution of along the emission spectrum, and uh, looking at different spectral bands, in this case, around center about 460 nanometers, which were NADH fluoresces. You can actually notice that uh, low-grade glioma, which is in green, has uh, a much shorter lifetime than the normal tissue and also much shorter than a high-grade glioma. And of course, this, this uh, um, signature can be associated with different fluorophores or these molecules that emit light in tissue. So you can use further these parameters to, to in classification models that allows you to distinguish and see how well you can classify and distinguish between different conditions. So again, this was a study which we carry out for, for in, in a, about, uh, this was about 35 uh, patients and on 73 uh, measurement points that gives us your initial indication that we can actually able to characterize different tissue and, and diagnose tissues during surgical intervention. So this was for brain tumors. We also work on looking at head and neck uh, uh, cancer. And this is an example where uh, we build a probe uh, that was used to interrogate the, the oral cavity. And these are some results from an early study. We choose these two mothers, brain tumor and head and neck tumors, because these this, uh, tumors are typically integrated or infiltrated in, a, in a functional areas. Therefore, the accuracy of surgical resection is very important. You cannot remove too much tissue because you can affect, for example, neurological functions, or uh, if you leave too many uh, uh, disease cells, then the cur uh, cancer will recur very quickly. So um, as I said, we, we carried this experiment. We demonstrated that this is feasible to distinguish between uh, tumor and, and normal tissue in numerous patients. Uh, we developed mathematical models to analyze this data. However, uh, the question is, did we solve this problem? And we learned that no. 30 seconds how, for a point measurement is an infinity for a surgeon. Secondly, uh, we need to correlate this fluorescence information with the location from where this measurement was taken. So more recently, we are working on a new approach that allows us to provide real-time feedback and to also identify the location from where this, this uh, measurement was taken. So we came up, I don't know how many of uh, in the audience are uh, um, in uh, optical uh, photonics area, but the idea is that we can use a laser pulse uh, to excite the fluorescence through a fiber optic, a very simple fiber optic. You can like the fluorescence through the same fiber optic, and we can use a set of dichroics and filters to se se spectrally separate the fluorescence on, on several spectral bands, which carry most of disc discriminant information. This light is passed through fiber optics of distinct lengths, and therefore, in response to one excitation pulse, we can now get several decay or fluorescence uh, uh, pulses, uh, which are separated or delayed in time. And we can analyze this very quickly now, and you can have a point measurement Please, uh, which takes place very, um, you know, manner of um, microseconds. Then you can scan, and you can have a continuous uh, information about the fluorescence lifetime. And then you can do a raster scanning, and you can eventually obtain what is called a spectroscopic image. Um, so this is kind of a molecular imaging, but without probes. And you can map the biochemical features on the surface of the tissue. So this is our new instrument, uh, which is a relatively uh, small footprint. It can be moved again in the operating room. And uh, what I'm going to show you is some proof of principle how this works. 
And I'll give you two examples. One is related to how it can be used for brain tumor diagnosis during surgical interventions and provide real-time feedback. And second, how we integrate this one with the Da Vinci surgical robot so it can be done during surgery for head and neck tumors. So what you see in the, in the left uh, side, it is an, uh, a tissue phantom which has two embedded in, in it, uh, in, uh, which is a brain tissue phantom. We embedded this small tumor um, uh, which um, is basically uh, an agar uh, which embedded this quarin one fluorophore. And the task is to use our fiber optic probe to distinguish in real time the location of the tumor. works. So you just move this fiber optic across the surface and when this little tumor is detected, you can see actually, um, this again is a phantom, you can see that the color um, on this graph change. Yes. So I have signal in different channels. So in real time you can actually distinguish and identify the position of the tumor. However, you cannot trace back where this is uh, coming from. So a way to do it, can we change? Thanks. Oops. Oh. Can we play that movie, please? The, the one on top first. Thanks. Okay, so um, now we have a way using an Amy beam and uh, um, color segmentation method, which is a, an algorithm that we developed to not only locate the tumor, but to trace where the back where the tumor is located by painting the fluorescence lifetimes on top of uh, white light image. And since we talk a lot about, can we go? So, um, and this is one more realistic sample. This is a steak this time. <laughs> So you can see actually this thing can be used also to look at uh, um, um, use a quality control for, uh, for, for meat. <laughs> so you can actually paint these biochemical features on top of the tissue sample on the white light image. And this again is done in, in real time. This is just twice uh, the speed of real time display of, of, of data. So um, the next application that I'm going to briefly talk about is our efforts to actually integrate this with a Da Vinci surgical robot. And what we see here is basically our instruments from this Da Vinci uh, um, robot, which are in the mouth of the patient. And typically, the surgeon would control uh, these instruments remotely and uh, what you actually see, so if you, if you don't like blood, so please close your eyes. <laughs> so this is a base of tongue resection. If we play this move. So this is what actually the surgeon will see in his uh, um, field of view and has to make a decision where to cut and wh where is the surgical margin. So has no information, it's just his educated guess and training that allows uh, him or her to, to make this decision. So we want to use our fiber optic probe this time to actually diagnose before cutting. So uh, this is one of the first experiments in vivo where we use this time a, a pig, 
Um, again, this is live experiment with our setup. You can see some of these um, devices on the left side. We can now clean the fiber. You saw it on the on the uh, upper side where we have the uh, the probe uh, working in conjunction with other instruments which are in uh, in the mouth of this this uh, this pig, and the real time display of diagnostic data. So this is another demonstration using this aiming beam. This is a, a, a tongue of uh, again the pig uh, measured in vivo where you can paint directly back or back project the fluorescence lifetime on this white light image and you can see how these taste buds are actually highlighted in, in real time. So imagine that you have a tumor or you want to separate between different types of tissues. This will allow you to distinguish the biochemical composition of various tissues. So, oops. And this is another example where this probe is uh, introduced through a laparoscopic technique. And we, uh, we can again, uh, again back project different fluorescence lifetime values uh, on different organs which are in the abdominal uh, cavity. So you notice that, for example, the, the, uh, the spleen, I think it stopped, will have different, different lifetime values than the liver and also uh, further the, the colon. So we have now a means to actually work directly in vivo, both in oral cavity, but also we can uh, access different other internal organs. So, um, um, we are working actually developing this platform technology based on fluorescence lifetime uh, and imaging that can be used as a standalone probe, can be integrated with endoscopes, can be integrated also biopsy needles, and also integrated with surgical robot. So this, in principle, this can be used as a point, oops, um, as a platform at different stages of uh, cancer management for diagnosis, surgical guidance, and also monitoring uh, therapy. And current application includes brain tumors. So we have, we are funded to look on 20 patients using this new technique. Head and neck tumors, we are funded to look, uh, have a clinical trial in 100 patients. And we started more recently to look at breast tumors. And uh, in addition to cancer management, the same technique platform actually is currently developed for intravascular applications. You can see here a fly-through for disease coronary artery. And this is in conjunction with ultrasound, the scatter microscopy. So it's a multimodal system that we put together, again, for cardiovascular diagnosis. And also, uh, the same uh, type of technique can be used for uh, non-destructive uh, uh, quality control of uh, bioengineered tissue, or looking of tissue construct prior to implantation, during stem cell differentiation, and after implantation eventually in, in a living, uh, living animal or even in humans. So, uh, And with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, our funding, uh, my uh, laboratory, and uh, also clinical collaborators and at UC Davis uh, Medical Campus who contributed to uh, uh, some of this work. And thank you very much for your attention.